Psalm chapter 2, excuse me, Psalm number 2, Psalm 2, and we're, this is our third sermon on Psalm 2, and we're looking at uh, Psalm 2, which is about the reign of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Messiah. And uh, we've got to the place where Jehovah is going to speak. There's four sections to the psalm. The narrator speaks, tells you what the nations are doing in their rage. Jehovah is going to speak. The son will speak. And then the narrator is going to apply in the last few verses the psalm. Uh, but we'll read the whole psalm and then we'll continue with our exposition. <clears throat> Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And people should be plural. The peoples imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. And here God responds, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. And he shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And now Christ responds, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou dost break them with a rod of iron, thou dost dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, or ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now we noted, you know, among the ancient Jews, <coughs> Psalms, two, Psalms 1 and 2 were considered always together as a unit and were sung together, and were considered the introduction to the whole Psalter. This is the introduction to the hymn book. Psalm 1, dealing with personal righteousness and wickedness. Psalm 2, dealing with national obedience and disobedience, national re rebellion, kings and nations. God is always concerned, not simply with individuals, but also with whole nations, covenantal bodies. And now we come to the part where Jehovah speaks. And we continue from last week, verses 5 to 6. After laughing at the foolishness of the heathen and their leaders, opposition to the Messiah, and this, by the way, is the only place in the whole Bible where God himself is said to laugh, and we know it's an anthropomorphism, obviously. God speaks in his wrath a word of warning, terror, and judgment to the rulers. Here's verses 5 and 6. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure, Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. <clears throat> the word then makes the turning point of the passage, marks the turning point of the passage where we learn that Jehovah does not tolerate rebellion against his throne, but intervenes in history. Okay, the Bible emphatically rejects deism and the idea that God created everything and then just kind of sits by and watches it and doesn't do anything. God's very active in history. He gives wicked nations, leaders, and peoples a certain amount of time to repent. <clears throat> when they do not, he must take action against them. The text says he speaks, for the divine word is power. Remember, he spoke the universe into existence, and it will accomplish whatever he says. <clears throat> the Bible portrays Jehovah as silent, holding his foes in contempt, as their wicked plots continue and their time of judgment becomes ripe. Remember, he gave the Canaanites 400 years. Then comes the Lord's display of his majestic holiness and glorious justice. God does not act until the leader and his people's iniquity is full. He waits till it's full, and he's waiting right now as the United States builds up its iniquity, as we pass pro-sodomite laws and we kill more and more babies. <clears throat> and pass legislation which is against the word of God. <clears throat> God's patience and long-suffering is often misunderstood as a toleration of sin. And it most certainly is not. Jehovah in his infinite wisdom 
waits until the perfect time to strike, a time determined by his attributes and his desire to glorify his son. The wrath builds up, the judgment builds up, and then God strikes. Sin is a provocation to Jehovah. And the high-handed, premeditated sin described in verses 2 and 3 is a double provocation. Here are the nations. Here are the political leaders, the prime ministers, the presidents, the kings, the judges, the governors, conspiring against Jesus Christ, hating the law of God, hating the Bible, rejecting Christ's authority. The idea common among professing Christians in America that Jehovah has decided to tolerate sin on a national scale in the New Covenant era is explicitly refuted by our text. And we're talking about the period after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the New Covenant era. God does not tolerate sin. <clears throat> God is angry with pluralism every day. And he hates our Christless constitution which allows for a plurality of false gods and a plurality of false religions to flourish in our land. Jehovah is biding his time as America's rebellion and iniquity ripens for judgment. The Civil War was a judgment upon North and South for a Christless constitution. The open toleration of false idolatrous religions and a form of slavery built on men stealing, which is a death penalty offense in God's law, that did not let Christian slaves go free after six years. You know, many of the uh, slaves became Christians. That didn't matter. They weren't set free. So they were enslaving Christians. They were acting like Pharaoh, the Southerners. The wickedness of America since 1960 is far greater than the wickedness of the 19th century. Our nation is ripening for judgment. God does not wink at the sins of a nation that exalts sodomites and adulterers and feminists and Christ-haters that permits women and doctors to murder babies in cold blood. It's abortion is premeditated murder. The women should be executed. The doctor should be executed, the secretaries at the office should be executed, and the nurses that participate should all be executed for first-degree murder. That's what it is. A nation that spits on the moral law and that mocks Christ's church. Remember that all the plans of the wicked will be brought to naught. Those who oppose the true religion because they hate its obligations and its restraints will be called to account. Our nation will be called to account. We must put Christ in the Constitution. We must repent on a corporate level. <clears throat> the idolaters saw the wind. They sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. They will be justly punished. Well, let's look now at the Messianic King. God the Father's answer to the rebellion of the people's nations and their rulers Rebelling against his authority is to set up the kingdom of the Messiah. Despite your conspiracies, despite your rebellious plans, despite your riotous gatherings, despite your autonomous humanistic laws and wicked constitutions, yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. What the people and the leaders hated and they wanted to destroy forever. Jehovah has established in this world definitively and progressively through Jesus Christ, his son. Remember, before Christ came, the kingdom extended to a tiny sliver of land in Palestine where Israel was, and the rest of the world was in darkness. And when Jesus came, he said, I didn't come to preach to the Gentiles. I came to preach to the house of Israel. But after Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead, the gospel goes to all nations. <clears throat> When the priests and the rulers prevailed on the Roman authorities to torture and crucify Jesus of Nazareth, thinking that he would be forgotten forever, they set in motion, they set in motion events which led to his exaltation and victory. The enemies rage, they think they've won. But they have dug their own grave. 
because Christ's redemptive obedience was necessary for his exaltation, his kingship. They will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, that is seated at the right hand of God the Father, ruling as king over the universe. They humiliated their anointed king and made him suffer and die. They thought they had gained a great victory, but Jehovah had the last laugh. You rage, and I accomplish victory. You fight the battle, but I win the war. I have set my king on Zion. And remember, at his trial, the high priest asked Jesus to his face, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Are you? And Jesus said, you said it. In other words, yes, I am. And then what did he say to him? You, you Jews, you leaders, you're going to see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of glory. That's not a reference to the second coming of Christ. It's a reference to him coming to destroy Israel and Jerusalem in AD 70. You're going to see my power manifested when I come and crush your nation and burn the temple to the ground and scatter you through all nations. Now, now that, uh, note that Jesus has designated my king. Christ is God's equal, God's fellow, God's son, God's firstborn, God's only begot begotten, and is chosen for universal rule by the Father. He is set up as king forever. <coughs> God's anointed is appointed and shall not be disappointed. The phrase I have set in Hebrew means literally, I have anointed. Jehovah has anointed Christ as king. Jesus was designated, appointed, or constituted king officially by God the Father. This occurred in two distinct stages. Jesus was set apart and anointed for ministry at his baptism, the baptism of John. And what did God say? We had a Trinitarian act. We had the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. We had God the Father speaking from heaven saying, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And what would a Jew think when he heard that? Well, he would think immediately of Psalm 2. <clears throat> and he was anointed beyond measure with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. <clears throat> Jesus was already king and was the Savior. But he was a king in a state of humiliation. He was a king who voluntarily limited his power as a divine human mediator. Then as a result of his redemptive obedience, his sinless life, his perfect life, he obeyed the law in exhaustive detail, his sacrificial death on the cross, he was appointed as the messianic king with power at the resurrection. And this is the focus of verse 7. Yes, he was a king. Yes, he was the son of God. But he voluntarily limited his power because he was in a state of suffering and humiliation. Note also... <clears throat> that Jesus has set up his mediatorial king upon my holy hill of Zion, verse 6. Now, it is important what we mean, uh, that we understand what God means by the holy hill of Zion. Zion originally referred to the hill on the north part of Jerusalem where the temple was built. <clears throat> it came to represent the whole city of Jerusalem. David captured the hill from the Jebusites, and as part of Salem or Jerusalem, he made it his capital city. On Mount Zion, Solomon, following Jehovah's instructions, built the temple where God dwelt with Israel and where the people approached God in sacrifice and worship. The kingship or dynasty of David and the building of the temple came together in God's plan because David was a type of Christ. And a lot of these prophecies that are messianic prophecies have a first an application in history to David and a more full, full, full application to Jesus Christ in history. <clears throat> David, uh, Christ fulfilled the Davidic covenant. And because the temple was a type of Christ as the only mediator between God and man and the only way to be reconciled to Jehovah and approach to him in worship. Now the name Zion, from the Semitic root to protect or stronghold or fortress, probably because it was a hill, is full of rich religious connotations in the Old Testament. It came to signify the city of God, the city of the great king, Psalm 46, 4 and 48, 2, a holy hill, 
uh, or a sacred hill, Joel 2.1, Zechariah 8.3, the chosen place of God's abode, Psalm 9.11 and 132.13, Jehovah's sanctuary, Psalm 20, verse 2, the goal of pilgrimage, Psalm 84, 5, and 7, the place of deliverance and salvation, Psalm 20, verse 2, 69, 35, the special place of praise and worship, Psalm 914 and 61, 1. After the ark came to rest in the temple, it was applied to the temple mount, Psalm 74, 68, and 69. Thus the expression Mount Zion in the far north, Psalm 42, 8. In Jeremiah, it is associated with the temple. 5028 and 5110. So it's a very rich term. Zion, where the Davidic dynasty ruled and where the temple with God's special Shekinah presence dwelt, was symbolic of the actual throne of God. <clears throat> now, the mercy seat, with the two cherubim facing inward, is a symbol of the throne room of God where the cherubim surround the throne of God. And God is said to have hovered above the mercy seat, and below the mercy seat is the Ten Commandments, and thus on the Day of Atonement, the blood was sprinkled upon the mercy seat by the priest, symbolizing the interposition of the blood of Christ as a covering for sin between God and his people, a broken law. The broken law was well, broken by the people and satisfied by the blood of Christ, their iniquity. <clears throat> The special presence dwelt above the mercy seat, which served as the throne. And the cherubim, which looked for, uh, inward, represented the angelic host in God's throne room. Paul says in Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, Believers have come unto Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So, our Lord now rules from the heavenly Zion. That which the temple pointed to, Christ is now there on God's throne. Our Lord now reigns to, to heavenly Zion, in heavenly Zion where he ascended. He is seated on God's throne at the Father's right hand. Thus at Pentecost, Peter quoting Psalm 110 verse 1, which is the most quoted passage in the New Testament from the Old Testament, he says this, <clears throat> This is Acts 2, 34 to 36. For David is not ascended into the heavens. He's rejecting this idea that Psalm 2 only applies to David or Psalm 110 only applies to David. You know, it applies to the Messiah. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he, he saith himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the seat of the Messiah's rule is not an earthly city. It is not a literal Jerusalem. He sits at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, ruling over his people, ruling over the whole world. It does not refer to a literal Jerusalem as dispensational premillennialists assert, but to the throne room in heaven itself. In the New Testament, Zion is also referred to, also refers to the people of God of the church, primarily in quotations from the Old Testament as Romans 9.33 and Peter, 1 Peter 2.6. Thus the term is rich and multifaceted. In the main, it points us to the throne room of God in heaven where Jesus, the resurrected king, rules over the nations. Remember he ascended into heaven? The, the apostles watched him go up and he disappeared in a cloud. And an angel said he's going to return in a like manner. Now he has a real true human body that he'll have forever with his scars. And Jesus, the divine human mediator, remember he's exalted in his human nature. In his divine nature he can't be exalted any more than he already is. But in his human nature he's exalted. And in his human nature he is sitting in heaven on God's throne. And in Daniel... There's that passage, what is it, Daniel chapter 2, where it talks about the Son of Man coming up to the God, and he stands before the Ancient of Days. If you read the Hebrew, it's not talking about him descending in the clouds, it's talking about him ascending. And he stands before God the Father, and he's bestowed with the kingdom that is forever, that lasts forever. <clears throat> 
because it also stands for the Gospel Church Puritans, and the older commentators believe it also speaks, at least by way of application, to Christ's throne set up in his church, that is, the hearts of all believers, and in all the societies they form. Jesus rules his church through his Holy Spirit, who applies his law word to the heart. The focus in our passage is on the Redeemer's rule from heaven, and his objective authority and power to rule. The moral law, by the way, is said to go forth from Zion. Isaiah 2, 3 and Micah 4, 2. It originates in the heavenly Zion, and we pray for Jesus' his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yet it is taught to the nations by the church. And the word Zion there is being applied to the church. The law of God and the doctrine of the gospel proceeds from the throne room where Christ rules to the church and through the church to the nations. The prophets, using Old Testament terminology, pictured all nations flowing into the church to receive instruction and learn God's law. Now listen to this. This is Isaiah 2, 2 to 3. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. Okay, the expression latter days, I'm not going to take time to prove it, but if you look at how the expression is used in the New Testament, it refers to after the resurrection of Christ. The latter days does not refer to the period immediately before the second coming of Christ. It refers to the new covenant era. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay, now, premillennialists say, well, that referring to Christ comes back, and he sets up a literal thousand-year kingdom, and he's going to be in Jerusalem teaching the nations. That's not what it refers to at all. It refers to Zion as the church, and all nations will flow into the church and learn the law of God. <clears throat> in the book of Hebrews, Mount Zion, God's holy mountain is spiritualized to mean the church. Hebrews 12, 22. Hence, in this prophecy, it must mean that the church, having attained a position, so that it stands out like a mountain on a plain, will be prominent and regulative in the, all the world's affairs. And then in Isaiah 42, 1 and 3 and 4, we read this. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will bring forth justice um, for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. So he's going to successfully carry forth his task to its completion in that he's going to place justice in this earth. Now, what does that mean? That means that the nations are going to adopt his law. Nations are going to believe the Bible. Nations are going to submit to Jesus Christ before the second coming. In this connection, earth is not limited to Palestine, but refers to the whole earth. And this points up to the university, universality of the servant's work. Furthermore, the servant will actually place judgment in the earth, when he completes his work, judgment will be found in all the earth. The conversion of the heathen is not the result of one mighty eschatological act, the second coming, or a supposed seven-year tribulation, but of the gradual, tireless work of the servant. Hence, it may be said that inasmuch as the servant works through his servants, they too are included here in the mysterious figure of which the chapter speaks. The isles, or coastlands, await Christ's doctrine or law. The Messiah's work continues through his church and is not completed until every far-off continent receives the gospel. So Christ is discipling the nations, and his work is not completed until all civil governments base their laws upon his perfect law. And the victory of the gospel is so assured that the Holy Spirit adds the words justice to victory when Matthew's gospel quotes this in Matthew 12, 20. 
And you say, oh, come on, that's referring to the second coming, and Christ is going to set up a literal thousand-year kingdom. No, it's not. What did Jesus say at the Great Commission? What were his marching orders to the disciples? All authority in heaven and on earth has been, past tense, given to me. Okay, when was it given to him? At his resurrection. All authority has been given to me, Therefore, go, disciple the individuals here and there. No. Go disciple the nations, commanding them, baptizing them, discipling them, until all nations are Christian nations. That is the Great Commission. It involves evangelism, yes, but it's more than that. It's discipling. People become converted, and then they learn the law of God. They learn to submit to God's Bible, to the Word of God. <clears throat> Thus, the teaching of the psalm is crystal clear. Is crystal clear. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus is exalted to the right hand of the Father, God the Father, and has all power and authority as the victorious divine human mediator over heaven and earth. He is the head over all things for the sake of his church, notwithstanding the dedicated, fervent efforts of his enemies. And yes, he has lots of enemies, and today there's lots of enemies. Hillary Clinton, President Obama, you name it. They're out there. He is the king who controls the channels of grace and sends his spirit when and where he pleases, according to the covenant of redemption. He is the ruler of the nations, who governs all things through providence. Nations rise and fall at his command. If a nation falls, Christ commanded it. The Roman Empire fell because Christ wanted it to fall. Israel was crushed and scattered because they were persecuting his church, and he commanded it. God the Father has appointed, declared, or constituted him the mediatorial king with power at his resurrection because of his redemptive obedience. We must always remember that the conquest of the white horse rider in history is founded upon and flows from his redemptive victory. Okay, the judicial victory at the cross where he paid for the sins of his elect, his people, all over the world, millions and millions of people all over the world throughout history. <clears throat> that is the judicial foundation of the Great Commission. On that basis, he goes forth as the white horse rider conquering through the sword that comes out of his mouth, which symbolizes the word of God, the preaching of the word of God. John Calvin says this, quote, quote, Christ was sent in order to bring the whole world under the authority of God and obedience to him. And this shows that without him, everything is confused and disordered. Before he came to us, there can be no proper government amongst us. And therefore, we must learn to submit to him if we desire to be well and justly governed. And then uh, the words of Matthew Henry on this passage are very instructive. <clears throat> Listen to what he says. We are to sing these verses with a holy exaltation, triumphing over all the enemies of Christ's kingdom, not doubting, but they will all of them be quickly made his footstool and triumphing in Jesus Christ as the great trustee of power. And we are to pray in firm belief of the assurance here given, Father in heaven, thy kingdom come, let thy son's kingdom come. Well, that's God, God the Father's response. Now let's look at the Messiah. He's going to speak next. We have heard the rebellious people's tumult, their riotous rage against Christ and against Jehovah. <clears throat> we have also heard God the Father's inner thoughts about this rebellion. Now in verses 7 and 9, the Messiah himself speaks. And there are a number of important things about the anointed one's words regarding his sovereignty and kingdom. Note first the drama, the poetic drama of Christ's response. It is though the son looks upon the kings and the people's rage-filled rebellion and responds as a prophet. 
And of course, we should say the prophet, capital P. He reveals Jehovah's decree. We must remember that the Son of God is the Word who reveals to us the Father and the thoughts and plans of the Father. And the importance of revealing this decree is twofold. Number one, a decree is God's will, appointment, or plan for what is to take place in history. It is made before the foundation of the world and cannot be altered, overturned, or avoided by mankind. God the Father and God the Son in the covenant of redemption, that's what theologians refer to it, it's an agreement made between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit before the world was created. God the Father agreed to send the Son into the world. Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Son of God, agreed to come and voluntarily assume a position of humility and submission unto the Father's will to uh, accomplish a redemption for the elect, for his people. And God, the Holy Spirit, agreed to apply that redemption uh, throughout history, uh, being sent from the Son. Remember, the Holy Spirit is controlled by the mediator. He's the one who sends the Spirit in history. <clears throat> Number two, as a consequence, the Messiah is informing his enemies that the, his enemies that their plans against his throne and mediatorial dominion are futile. He's just telling him what you guys are doing is completely futile. It's stupid. His victory cannot be altered. The kingdom of Christ has an unalterable stability. It will happen. It will come to pass. And then second, in the decree, the first thing described is the Messiah's relationship to God the Father. Now, because we have poetry here, beautiful poetry, the Puritans were fond of giving multiple meanings to the statement. They would say it describes the, the eternal generation of the Son from the Father. And the expression this day is interpreted as a moment of no succession, no yesterday, no tomorrow, but from all eternity. Thus, it is said to be a statement of the Messiah's divinity. The inter-Trinitarian relationship of the Father to the Son Others would say it refers to the Incarnation, when the Eternal Son assumed a human nature and was born in Bethlehem. The best and most sensible way to view this statement is to simply accept the inspired, infallible interpretation of it in the New Testament. What does the New Testament do with this passage? Well, according to Paul, it refers to the resurrection of Christ. Acts 13, 28 to 36 says this, And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. And then when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings that the promise which was made to the fathers... God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he raised up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm. Okay, so he just, discussed, he just mentioned the resurrection. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus. I will give you the sure mercies of David, and that can be translated blessings. Therefore, he also said in another psalm, you will now allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. <clears throat> so Paul says, look, this cannot refer to David, for he rotted away and his tomb is with us. It can only refer to Jesus Christ. The tomb is empty. This interpretation makes sense, for Psalm 2 is about the Messiah. It refers to Jesus' work after he assumed a true human nature and achieved a perfect redemption. In his most theological epistle, Paul says that Jesus, this is Romans 1.4, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. 
Now, we must not forget that the resurrection only concerns the Savior's human nature. By his resurrection and ascension, the Son of God incarnate entered into a new phase of sovereignty. We already mentioned he was a king, and they called him a king before his crucifixion and his resurrection. But after the resurrection, he's a king with power. That, that verse in the scripture reading, I didn't come as judge. He's talking about a state of humiliation. He came to die. He came to suffer and die. He did not come to be a judge. He did not come to di dispute men's problems. He came to heal the sick and live a life of humiliation and suffering and die. But once he rose from the dead, he's a king with power. Things are changed now. We no longer know him after the flesh, Paul says. <clears throat> He entered upon a new phase of sovereignty and was endowed with a new power correspondent with and unto the exercise of the mediatorial lordship which he executes as head over all things to his body, the church. In Hebrews 1 to 3, uh, 3 to 4, this point is stated clearly. This is what it says. When he himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So once again, uh, we, we, Paul wrote, it's 98% sure that Paul wrote Hebrews. And here's Paul once again applying it directly to Psalm 2, the resurrection and glorification of Christ. The description of the son as, having, uh, as being now seated signifies the completion of the work of purification, conveying the notion of rest after the fulfillment of a mission. So that's part of it. And what was that mission? He came to fulfill the will of the Father. He came to live a life of suffering and humiliation. And he came to offer himself as a blood sacrifice to God the Father for the sins of his people. He came to suffer and die. <clears throat> but much more than that, his position at the right hand of God, the majesty being a uh, periphrasis for God. The Jews, of course, he's writing to the Hebrews, and the Jews don't like to use the word Elohim, and they don't like to use the word Jehovah, so they, they have substitutes for it, indicates that his is the place of the highest honor, that he is not merely on a seat, but on a throne, and that he is not just sitting, but ruling. In 12.2, Paul says that having endured the cross, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is our sovereign Lord. His session, moreover, is on high. His exaltation, which started with his resurrection from the grave and continued with his ascension into heaven, is completed by his session. That means his sitting as king at the right hand of God. Remember Stephen, he's being martyred. He's being killed. He's being stoned. And he says, oh, I see Jesus at the right hand of God. And it just made him even angrier. He saw a vision. There's Christ at the right hand of God. Well, a Jew understood what that meant. They're not merely saying that Jesus is the, the Messiah, the anointed one. They're saying that Jesus is God. The recession refers to his sitting down at the right hand of God. <clears throat> In Psalm 110, verse 1, the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament, says, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is used to prove his authority over the whole universe. Paul says, I'm just emphasizing to you how this is so emphasized in the New Testament, and it's, it's not being taught today. Uh, Paul says <clears throat> that God raised him from the dead. This is Ephesians 1, 20 and 21. And made him sit at the right hand in the heavenly places. Similarly, Peter says that Jesus, 1 Peter 3, 22, has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. In other words, everything is subject to him. And then Paul alludes to Psalm 110, 1 in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, when he says that Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So, Christ is exalted at his resurrection. He's ascended to God the Father. He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He's king over the universe. He's been given all authority over heaven and earth. He is the king with power by the resurrection of the dead. And he is progressively throughout history subduing his enemies, subduing pagan nations and placing them under his feet. 
In his first gospel sermon, Peter said, God made, in the word, um, the Greek word, apoisin, appointed, constituted, him both Lord and Christ. Paul in Philippians 2 notes that because of the successful completion of his earthly work of redemption, his humiliation and suffering to the point of death, the death of the cross, God exalted him to the highest place possible and gave him, that is the theanthropic Christ, the divine human mediator, the name which is above every name, that is the title Lord. Philippians 2.9. The Lord, his official title, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, 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 the title Lord means he's Lord over everything. Angels, demons, heaven, earth, heaven, hell, the sky, everything. Everything is under his authority. Consequently, the apostle says every tongue should confess the lordship of Christ and every knee should bow before him. Verses 10 to 11. Now, once again, it is necessary to note that all these statements refer to Jesus' mediatorial role as the Messiah. Obviously, as the second person of the Trinity, as God, he always had all authority. He always had all rule. He always had all power. But it's talking about his human nature, the Messiah. It is the glorious lordship of Christ that, along with the cross, was central to apostolic and evangelistic preaching. It's totally essential. When they talked about Christ, their gospel was not merely Christ crucified, and that's obviously central, but the gospel also was Christ resurrected and glorified. Jesus is risen from the dead. He's been exalted to the right hand of God. God therefore commands all nations to repent. That's not, oh, Jesus is up there. He's waiting for you to make a decision for Christ. Won't you let him save you? That's not the gospel. Jesus is up there. He's done his thing. He's died. Now it's up to you. Use your free will. Accept Jesus as your savior. Let him into your heart. That's not the gospel. Jesus has risen from the dead. He is the Lord over the universe. God therefore commands all men everywhere to repent. And if you don't repent, you're going to go straight to hell. Now, this observation raises two crucial questions. We're not going to, we're going to get to probably the second one in the afternoon. First, why is this so essential to gospel preaching? That's the first question. And second, why does most of modern evangelical theology and preaching postpone Jesus' universal kingship to the second coming and a supposedly earthly literal rule from Jerusalem? That's uh, dispensational premillennialism, which arose in the 1800s through a a uh, man named uh, Charles Nelson Darby it didn't exist prior to that. Now, you can find premillennialism in some of the church fathers, but dispensational premillennialism is an invention of the 19th century. John Darby, John Darby excuse me, John Nelson Darby. <clears throat> and historic premillennialism, which is far better than, obviously far better than dispensational premillennialism. I have uh, books by George Eldon Ladd, which is probably the best historical premillennial scholar out there. And he flat out says, oh, obviously, the New Testament teaches Christ as king. But his kingship doesn't really become active until the second coming. It's kind of asleep right now. It's just, it's kind of postponed. When he comes back, then it'll be active. But that's not the teaching of the New Testament or the prophets. Well, the answer to the first question lies in the fact that Jesus' absolute lordship is connected in scripture with number one, the fact that a crucial aspect of Jesus' role as uh, mediatorial king is his responsibility, and this is crucial, his responsibility to apply his redemptive work to his people, to the elect throughout history. As Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, as it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The fact that Jesus is seated in glory does not mean that he is inactive and waiting for people to make a decision for Christ. It is another crucial phase of his ministry. 
The foundation of his work in history has been accomplished by his sinless life, his sacrificial death, and his resurrection. But the application of that redemptive work must be done by the living Messiah, the living mediator. This involves ceaseless activity and subduing a people for himself by sending the Holy Spirit unto them. Peter told Israel at Pentecost, listen to this carefully, Acts 2, 32 to 33. This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, okay, that's part of his exaltation. God promised Jesus in the covenant of redemption, if you earn redemption, if you suffer and you die, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. What that means is, is, as the mediator, exalted at the right hand of God, Jesus Christ himself is personally responsible for sending the Holy Spirit to his church and for sending his Holy Spirit to individuals regenerating their hearts. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this. Who's the he? Jesus. He poured out this which you now see and hear. As the mediator who obeyed unto death the will of the Father, Jesus receives the authority to send the Holy Spirit. By his resurrection, Christ became the one who sends the Spirit to regenerate and sanctify sinners. Because of his glorification, due to his resurrection, victory, everyone for whom Jesus died on the cross will receive spiritual life, which includes the gifts of faith and repentance unto life. I didn't take the time, but you can find passages. Faith is called a gift more, uh, more than once in the Bible. And so is repentance. How, why are they called gifts? We're the one who has, we, Christ doesn't believe for us. We have to believe. Well, they're gifts because in regeneration, when the Holy Spirit opens up your blind eyes, the Holy Spirit draws you to Christ and gives you a love of Christ and takes away that dead heart, that heart of stone, that heart of flesh, circumcises that heart and gives you a love of Christ. And that enables you to believe. And it's, it's a gift of faith. In addition, the resurrection and glorification of Christ is the guarantee that the life-producing spirit will also raise the Christian dead and give them spiritual glorified bodies at the second coming. That's the whole argument in 1 Corinthians 15. We only rise from the dead spiritually because Christ rose from the dead. We only rise from the dead literally, bodily, and are given new glorified bodies because... Christ rose from the dead, and we were united with him in his life, death, and resurrection. Once we understand the glorification of Christ, we see that one must either hold to a limited or definite atonement, or one must deny the mediatorial kingship of Christ in history. If, contro if Christ controls the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit goes and what he does and works, uh, he controls the application of his own redemption, doesn't he? What does that mean? It means salvation is of the Lord. God gets all the glory. Why do you believe in Christ? Well, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. You are nothing but a corpse in God's eyes. You are spiritually blind, spiritually deaf, dead as a doornail. You hated God. You hated Christ. You hated the Bible. And Jesus Christ died for you on the cross. He had mercy on you. He sent his spirit into your heart. And that regenerated your dead heart and purified it and sanctified it and opened your blind eyes and opened your deaf ears and drew you to Christ. And the Greek word for drawing unto Christ in John means to drag. It's the same word used when they drag their uh, nets of fishes. So who gets the glory in your salvation? You don't. Faith is a gift. Christ gets the glory. He gets all the glory. You get none of it. Once we understand the glorification of Christ, we also see the necessity to accept the perseverance, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. The glorified mediator is active on behalf of his chosen people as he dispenses mercy, grace, and help in times of testing and temptation. Hebrews 2, 18, 4, 14 to 16, Acts 7, 55 and following. Paul says he has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Hebrews 6.20. He is the lead climber or captain of our salvation. Hebrews 7.20. He always lives to make intercession for them. 
his people, his sheep. And we are told that his intercession is efficacious. God doesn't turn his son down. So you have a choice. You can either believe that Christ's intercession is ineffective and God doesn't listen to his son, or you can believe that salvation is definite and supernatural. It's not a work of man. It's a work of God solely. He is alive right now in heaven, preparing a place for all true believers, John 14, 2. To argue that real believers who have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit can fall away and be lost forever is to assert that the mediator's intercession can be ineffectual, and such thinking is totally unscriptural. You persevere because of his mediation. You persevere because of the work of the Holy Spirit. You persevere because Christ paid the price. Not because you're a wonderful person. Yes, I acknowledge that in sanctification we have to cooperate. We have to work. But we do so because God first works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. Okay, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to deal with the second point. And we're going to deal with the rest of this passage, which is very rich. Uh, so let us pray, and then we're going to go to the Holy Supper. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this incredible teaching about your dear son, Jesus Christ. Cause us to love him. Cause us to glorify his name. Cause us to submit to his will. Cause us to bow the knee to him and kiss his pierced feet. And pay him homage and obeisance. For he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the captain of our salvation. He is the glorified Messiah, the mediatorial king. And we owe everything to him. And when we see him in heaven, as it says in Revelations, we're going to take our crowns and our everything we've been given and we're going to throw it at his feet. For he has done it all for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.